possibly like Evanescence bring me to life uh, mm -hmm. just because they they need to be woken up. They need to be woken back up. Wake me up. I can't wake up. Inside. They need to they need to wake up <laughs> inside. Yeah. One, two. Swinging a drive toward right center. Back goes Robert. Back near the stands. That ball is gone. A game winning home run for Chris Morrell. Can you believe it? Listen to this crowd. Welcome back to the Brotherly Cubs podcast. I'm your little brother, Zach. And I'm your big brother, John. We are your brothers who love everything Cubs baseball. If you enjoy talking about the Cubs, then hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, and join us every week as we dive into the power, the speed, and the best team in the National League. Uh, we would like to start off each podcast with a playful question for all 79 of our subscribers. Encourage you to put your answer in the comments. Today, Zach, I ask you, if the Cubs were a musical group, what genre of music would they play and what would be their hit song? Uh, what would their the hit Cubs song are, be called? The Cubs make me sad, so I'm thinking of like early 2000s hardcore metal, possibly like Evanescence Bring Me to Life, uh, <laughs> just because they, they need to be woken up. They need to be woken back up. Wake me up. I can't wake up. Inside. They need to they need to wake up <laughs> inside. Yeah. <laughs> Outside, inside, just everywhere. Every Yes. Every body part. Yeah, just specifically the ones that use a bat to hit the ball and the ones that use a anyways. <laughs> uh we just just, you know, just wake up thinking old school. Um, I think it's 38 special. Hold on loosely because we're in for a rough ride. Um, so we have the Reds, obviously, and uh, they're not in town. We're in town, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be tough. So we just got to hold on loosely, but tightly at the same time. Yeah, but their schedule does eat, um, lighten up a little bit here, too, at the, at the same time. So mm -hmm. um, they do have a chance, right? Yeah. To just, I mean, to just they're win some they just, games. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was they're what seven back of the Brewers, and then they just closed it to I think two games yesterday. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so that kind of leads us right into our next segment about the Cubs. Um, now sitting at 500, they're 31 and 31 on the season, they're second in the NL. Uh, now again, like I said, only five games back with the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, but before that, um, the Cubs had swept. The White Sox, they had lost six straight before that, six straight series, and had not won two games in a row since May 4th and 5th versus the Brewers at Wrigley. And our last significantly easy win, which would be um, a win not involving a closed situation, was May 15th, as noted by Boog Shambi yesterday on last night's broadcast on Marquee. Zach, what are your thoughts on this small two-game sweep of the White Sox, and do you take the Cubs seriously now that they have won two games in a row? Yeah, uh, this is a weird couple games where I thought they would sort of run away with them, aside from Eric Fetty's a good pitcher. But I, I thought they were going to dominate, and they were losing and had to come back both games. The comebacks were very impressive. Like, those are not mm -hmm. easy comebacks to make, even against any team, despite the fact the White Sox are on pace to lose like 130 games or something. Um, lost 13 games in a row after the series. I'm just happy they won. You know, I mean, would I like them to win 10 to one or something? Sure. You know, I want them to win 15 to zero, whatever it is. They need an easy win. They still haven't gotten that in a while. Like you said, it's been like a month, uh, but I'll take it. That's, that's the summation of that series. I'll just, I'll take it. Can they get on a roll? Can that help them? You know, get the offense going. The offense definitely looked a little better, right? The last couple games. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Suzuki's. He's starting to hit the ball well today. He hit a two-run home run. Um, so right mm -hmm. now the Cubs are losing two to three um, yep. to the Reds, but um, still yeah. going on. The game's barely, I think, fifth inning. So yeah. So yeah, I, like you said, I mean, you take those games um, and just kind of put them in your pocket and move on, and and you know, you hang your hat on on games like that when you can come back. I mean, it was basically the script as the day before. Um, yeah, they're down, I think, five to Same nothing. Score. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so it's it's weird it's it's like almost deja vu i guess 
And then, you know, hitting hitting um, home run, Mike Talkman hit a home run off of uh, Opec. Yeah. I think it was 100 miles an hour, and you're just like, wow. I mean, that's it's impressive, you know, when you can get ahead of it at 100 miles an hour and, and for the game-winning home run. I mean, that's it's a big, big win for the Cubs, so hopefully they can build off of that. That's a little reminiscent of the Michael Bush walk-off home run from a month or so ago uh, yeah. when he was the first batter of, of the bottom of the ninth. And he had a walk off homer in a and also a rainy game, but it was like first batter, first couple pitches, boom, home run. Uh, and on the second pitch of the inning too. So, like we talked about Hayden Wesneski, that becoming a problem, giving up home runs late in the game. Luckily, the Cubs were able in both instances to uh, to get that rally going late. We haven't really seen that right. Those rallies late, a few rallies late right. in the game, but. I mean, even last night's game was like box. It was like Michael Bachman and Michael Talkman, you know? <laughs> I forgot. Someone made a joke like that, and I, was, I, I for, totally forgot to uh, just internalize that they, that, you know, Michael Walkoffman. There's so many, so many memes and just. It's a talk runs. off, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And incredible. I've never seen two run score on box before, I don't think in my entire life. So that was. That just shows you we're just the essence of we'll take it. It's like, all right, we're not yeah. scoring, but they got box. So score in a wild pitch. It will take whatever, throw the ball into the stands like Milton Bradley from 15 years ago <laughs> and run scores. If you do that, you know, we'll take it. That's, that's a team that's 15 and 45. Like you got to beat that team, right. you know, take whatever you can get. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I don't think it's how, you know, many Cub fans would have drawn it up. You know, winning a one run ball game twice and, you know, against the 15 and whatever 40, 34 socks. Yeah. Um, but a win is a win. Yeah. Um, so I know we, we have some injuries to talk about. Um, the Cubs have, it looks like 52 players that are injured. That's probably true if you count the minor leagues, but they definitely are, are both simultaneously getting a little healthier. I mean, on the position player side. I know Nick Madrigal just broke his hand <laughs> on a uh, on a hit by pitch. So bad news for him because he just went down to the minors, had a good game, then I got feel, hit by pitch. It's bad news, but I, I can't help but think, man, that's actually good news. So they can't bring him back up. Can't bring him back. You know, it's I mean, like, they might sixty. Can't day bring him back up. <laughs> send him to the gulag like, or whatever. Send him to a Russian labor camp, <laughs> uh, which is anywhere Arizona. but the yeah. <laughs> send him to Arizona Any, in the summer. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll, but yeah, I just, I feel, you feel bad for him. He was just demoted. And then, you know, suffering a hand, was it a hand fracture? Yeah, he broke his or hand. Or something like, yeah. Or a wrist that's, or something. I mean, yeah. that's a terrible year for you already. <laughs> yeah. Um, But it's, you know, it's hopefully, hopefully he can rebound from that and just kind of back up just in case one of our third basemen goes down, like Morel taking, you know, balls off the freaking toe. I don't know, man. It's starting to it's starting to look like there is actual depth at third base beyond maybe Bodie or Wisdom. I mean, Vasquez is a good defender. He's fast. He's got better instincts than Madrigal. And then deeper in the system, there's Matt Shaw, double A. Yeah, I could see. I would really like to see Madrigal just get DFA'd at some point. But maybe mm -hmm. the sixty day injury list is is what happens to him, and then they maybe they drop him this off season because there just won't be room for all the prospects coming up. Um, right. but you know, it's unfortunate for him. Um, probably the worst news that we've got, I know we've had a ton of setbacks. Monte and Meriwether both have had minor setbacks and Amante was supposed to be coming back, you know, soonish. It sounds like he's going to enter a throwing program. And as you know, that could take like a month. So he might be back. They might 60 day him too. And uh, just 60 day everybody. I mean, Meriwether is actually was originally due to be back right about this time. You know, the time of his original diagnosis, getting ready, uh, doing the throwing program, and then entering rehab. So obviously he hasn't entered rehab. He's not being shut down, but he's got to go through the throwing program. That can take a month and then get into rehab. So maybe end, you know, after All-Star break is what counsel said for him. And uh, you know, Kate Horton, again, the, the bad news is Kate Horton is shut down. He's got a lat strain. And uh, you could think he might be back closer to like August or something just based on the time it takes to get ramped up, get your innings right. back under you, and then start getting back to Iowa. So it, when it rains, it pours, honestly. They, they got some guys back. 
Um, Jordan Wicks looks like he's really close to getting back 65 pitches. And the only, it sounds like the only thing not getting him activated right now is just the Cubs usage of bullpen. Uh, they may end up using Ben Brown this weekend. And if they do, then they might bring Wicks back to take Brown's start, which is going to be this weekend against the Reds and then push out a guy, maybe like Porter Hodge. Uh, there's only a few, you know, optionable guys in the bullpen right now. So one of those guys is, is Porter Hodge been, you know, the bullpen has been a little bit better, but Wicks will definitely make this team you know, that much better. It's upgrading, uh, Ben Brown over, uh, Porter Hodge in, in the back end of the bullpen. Um, and I know we've, we have a few others with, with injuries, but Colin Brewer is back at Iowa at a back strain and, and Keegan Thompson is also back. Um, he had an illness and, you know, he, he had to sit on the 15 day. I don't know when those guys will be back. Is there anyone in particular you're excited to get back from in the injured list? I mean, thinking about it as you're talking about Cade Horton, um, him make some kind of an impact, maybe late mid August or, or late August, whenever that is um, so that he can, I mean, he's not going to be on an innings limit, right? I mean, his arm's going to be fine. Oh, yeah. Um, no, this will so he, surely take down his innings limit if you're going to sit for eight weeks or whatever it is. Yeah. Right. And he's going to have to build up, like you said. But, I mean, um, obviously, a lot of people were looking forward to, like, a June or July debut from him. That's kind of like a wait-and-see approach and just kind of – hopefully he doesn't head backs in his recovery. Golden Brewer, I'm just kind of – he's okay, I guess. You know, just um, – Keegan Thompson's just weird. He's just a weird guy. Like, he's – I'm not sure on with him. I mean, he had a viral il- illness. Um, so he's he's been okay when he's been up. Um, yeah. But, you know, as far as Jordan Wicks, not the sharpest. You know, you know, on June 2nd, I mean, he gave up oh, three earned. Yeah. And so I'm kind of hesitant about him and hoping, hoping that he can uh, right the ship um, when he does mm-hmm. come back to the, the big league team. So whether it's or starting. Yancy Almonte, for me, I guess, Yancy Almonte, I've kind of grown to appreciate him. Um, and he, I feel like, could possibly close games if he's healthy. Um, yeah. If he's like an emergency option and for reason, do not trade for anybody that could close games um, at right. the All-Star break, then he's yeah. an option. Um, just getting the regulars back in general, just, you know, it really helps to kind of build our depth back at the bullpen. Um, so it's just, it's a shame. Like you said, I mean, it feels like we had like 52 injuries, including the minors this year. And so, well, the, yeah, there are 52. Yeah. That's the, that's the total. Is that official? <laughs> no, I thought you were joking. Was, yeah, I was joking. I mean, Oh, there, there's probably, <laughs> there's, there's probably like, I think there was like, like 16 or 17 or something like that. Like it was like us and the yeah. Red Sox that were, Yeah. Wow. Almonte's good. I, I could see him closing as well against a quote unquote pocket of righties, kind of like Wisniewski was getting. Like he's got even a better sweeper and he has a better sinker <clears throat> than Wisniewski. So, yeah, he's proven it. And he, he's also been able to get lefties out too. So he's been a pleasant, pleasant surprise in that trade that we made. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping right. to see him again soon, obviously. And they are, they're going to need those guys. Right. But you know, that that's definitely something we can talk about in terms of the trade targets is is like who they would you know who they would bring Bullpen back if pieces. they don't get healthy right away yeah um as far as the battery mates of these pitchers the catcher um we have some catching woes the cubs catching woes we have um we're going to talk about miguel amaya and jan gomes um so zach <laughs> it's been terrible well, um, do we have to me- talk about them i mean <laughs> I mean, at some point, uh, I was in a minute, but I was going to say Miguel Maya right now. He's, I think he had a hit today. I mean, he had a single against the Reds, but he has two home runs on the season to match Jan Gomes' two home runs. Um, he has 13 RBIs to Jan Gomes' five RBIs, and he's batting 190, which is actually better than Jan Gomes, who is batting 148. Um, granted, I mean, uh, Miguel Maya has um, put or at bat um, compared to Jan Gomes and 23 hits, see me three hits. So kind of small. 
to say the least. Um, on base percentage is twenty point two five four. So yeah, for Jan Gomes, like I said, I mean, also two home runs. He has twelve hit, five RBI. Um, he's batting one forty eight. On base percentage is one seventy six. PS is four eleven. Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> I feel like you and I could put up those numbers to an yeah. extent. Uh, I mean, obviously that's that's not true, but also like this is what pitchers used to put up when they were hitting regularly in you know the nine spot in the lineup in the National League. Um, it's there's nothing they can really say, and I, and I would I would like to add this. Um, I know Miguel Amaya didn't have like an amazing year last year, but he he looked okay. Gomes, you know, still was a good defender. And career 707 OPS, but also I think he put up like a 720 or 730 OPS last year. I don't think there's a single Cubs fan. I mean, we saw what he did against lefties and in the clutch. I don't think there's a single Cubs fan that thinks John Gomes, a.k.a. gas money. I don't think we were calling for his head um, coming into the year. I mean, he seemed like a guy that was a lock. He had a team option. It wasn't super expensive. Yeah. But this is no. a guy you might have to DFA and in turn, you know, maybe trade for Diaz or Danny Jansen, one of those characters that can actually right. hit the ball on the ground or swing and miss. Like they're going to have more impactful at bats, and that's going to dramatically increase the bottom of the order, I think. Yeah, it's, I mean, looking at Jan Gomes's career, regular season OPS is 707. Um, he's clearly, clearly struggling now. Um, and it's, it's just gone on for too long. You know, he struck out the other day and you can see there's this, you know, you can see the fans in the, um, not court side, but what do you call that when they're sitting just right behind the catchers, mm-hmm. the, the home plate. Yeah. I and they're you. just, they're just shaking their head and looking at him as he's like <laughs> slowly walking back to the dugout. And you're like, God, man, it's you feel bad for him. Um, but at the same time, you know, if he's not throwing out like we have, you'd mentioned he, it's, um, the worst arm strength and transfer speed in league um, on throwing out on throwing out. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, and then on my ending, he's the worst still preventing catcher in the league. Um, courtesy of baseball savant and bleacher nation. Shout out to you guys. Yeah, shout out Bleacher those. Nation for posting those stats, which came from Baseball Savant. Um, yeah, it's what what is it? What are they offer? Really then? It's really frustrating. It's really just the comfortability of the pitchers with that catcher. Now, yes, yeah, the ability to call a game, which I feel like any catcher should be able to do. But there's pitch comms too nowadays. Um, right, it's just frustrating. That's there's it's a, really there's, frustrating that nothing has. Yeah, I mean, and I if funny enough, I actually looked back because I was curious. I know Tucker Barnhart uh, was on the Diamondback or is on the Diamondbacks, uh, which is yeah, surprising because yeah. they made the World Series last year. It's like you saw what he did, and yet you're signing. So <laughs> the Cubs DFA'd him in August 13th, and I think he was a little bit better than maybe Gomes or Maya. I think he had like a 600 OPS or a five something OPS. It was still terrible, but and he wasn't playing all the time, but. Right. That gave them opportunity to play Miguel Amaya. Of course, you know, we're doing, they're doing, you know, as bad, if not worse than him. But can you imagine if the Cubs waited until August 13th to DFA one of these guys? Obviously, they're not no, going to DFA it's, Amaya. It's going to be 37 year old Jan Gomes. Uh, yeah. Still, they're, I agree with you that it's bad that they haven't made a move. I think, yeah. I think if they trade for, if you look at, Elias Diaz, you know, of the Rockies, he hits in a very hitter-friendly park, but he has 27 right. RBIs and 800, 803 OPS. That's that's something to at least, at least bank on if he can hit in the 700s of the OPS. It's like 200 points better than what our guys are doing right now. And maybe Miguel Amaya can take a step back. I know he's playing more because we can't play on Gomes as much, so maybe Diaz becomes like a regular catcher and Amaya just becomes a backup. Same thing with Danny Jansen, a little bit, you know, less strong of the numbers, but a, only a fourteen percent strikeout rate, which is really low for a catcher, and twelve percent walk rate. I mean, that's like a pro hitter type. Um, you know, we have actually Alex Bregman on this list of targets as well. That's similar to his <laughs> numbers. Uh, that's really good. So you know, I prefer Danny Jansen in in that sense. 
but you can't go wrong with either of these two guys just getting better catcher and really just improving the hitting. We've seen the bullpen start to take, I wouldn't say leaps and bounds, but when they started to get healthy a little bit more, Council settled in. He, his bullpen is kind of his strength. He can get the young guys to get sent down to the minors and come back up and perform better. So I think maybe hitter comes first and then bullpen. Um, is there anyone in particular that you're excited for in terms of a trade target? Uh, you were thinking Jansen. I was thinking Diaz. Um, similar numbers, more RBI, a little bit higher average. Um, if you look at his OPS, so, um, again, shout out to Baseball Savant. Um, it's gone up 80 points, roughly 80 points over the last three years, uh, which is wow. huge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you look at 20, um, 2022 to, to right now, um, I mean, it's it's impressive. Um, so you can see the improvement there. He's going to be paid, oh, I think, like $6 million, um, hmm. five or $6 million, very similar to Jan Gomes. Um, but his pop, is it pop speed or whatever you, I forget what you call it? Mm-hmm. Transfer um, the yeah. pop to transfer, yeah, is um, it's in the, I think the ninety second percentile or something like that. Wow, I mean, he's got like he he would be a great get. Um, Colorado just need to know what to do though with the team. It's like they don't want to trade guys. Like I was hearing um, Ryan McMahon as a possible Yankees uh, trade candidate, um, but they but people were thinking that. Um, that they're not going to trade him. What are you doing with these players? These poor players, like maybe Chris Bryant, for example, um, that's just kind of wasting away their career in Colorado. And it's like, what are you doing with them? Like, start building a you know a youth movement and um, and trade some of these players. Yeah, that are valuable. Like a, a lot. Yeah. Danny Jansen has also said, great hitter, twelve percent walk rate. Um, I looked up their on base percentage as well. Which are both um, 351, oddly enough. Hmm. Um, so they're very, very, very targets. I think Toronto is kind of waiting to see all the way up until the deadline. Yeah, I'll wait and see. Um, mode. The, you know, yeah. As we're talking about trade targets, the Cubs are in the same kind of boat. I mean, they're also in wait and see mode, right? Uh, right. We're not definitive they're... buyers yet. Now, we're not definitive sellers either because we don't have as many <laughs> one year contracts, right? I mean, maybe it's Cody Bellinger, yeah. you know? He's an expiring. Exactly. But that's it's a difficult it's a difficult spot to be in. You don't want to be sellers anyways. So maybe that right. helps with the structure of their contracts are not easier to get rid of. They would still get rid of some guys though, I bet. I mean, yeah. let's be honest. Like if they if they become ten yeah. under five hundred at the deadline, they're going to get rid of this or lighter or you yeah, know, yeah, some I mean, of these guys that, that are expiring that are pitching well. I, I think they would right. probably do something like that. Yeah, I mean, you might as well, right? I mean, they're, it's like basically the same position they're, that they're in last year, right? They, except for we're, we're, we're still waiting for that run, right? Like that major run that they made um, yeah. to all of a sudden make them buyers. But again, it was the same thing. We didn't know what they were going to be, if they were going to be sellers or buyers. And usually you can kind of tell um, if your team is going to be one of the two. But we're just kind of in that, you know, we're 500 right now. We're five back. So it's like. You know, yeah. if there's ever a major injury or two to the to the Brewers, um, or to another division foe, you never know what's gonna what's gonna happen. So, yeah. some other targets we have here: Tanner Scott for the one point five zero ERA, three ninety seven FIP, he's seven of eight and save opportunities. He's twenty four percent K percentage, not bad. Eighteen um, percent walk rate. That's a little high, and similar yeah. to uh, Hector Neris. <laughs> Um, so he, I've, I've been, no, I haven't followed him throughout the whole season, but I mean, that's a pretty good, I'll take seven out of eight and save opportunities that Alzali has given us. Mm, I just, um, he's a lefty too. So it's not, yeah, he could just be viewed as another piece for the bullpen. What does it take? So to not get necessarily him, a close. I mean, if you can give up like Mervis and Canario or something of that guys that are redundant, I would think so. I would like, think you could give up Mervis and Canario. I think that that would probably be enticing enough. The 18% um, I would do that walk, in a heartbeat. The 18, 18% walk is way too high. The ERA it is, is high. good. Hector Neris also has a good ERA as well. So you kind of think... I'm um, sorry, go ahead. I don't know. The FIP is high. Uh, 
the save, like, it's funny. That's why we look at these peripherals, right? This is a perfect example of why you need the peripherals. The ER, right. we used to just, remember, we used to just look at ERA and save right. and opportunities, like your save percentage. Oh, percent save rate, 1.5 ERA. Great. Well, then if you look at the K rate, it's decent. Walk rate, way too high. Should be closer to 8 to 10. It's at 18. Hector's at, like, 16 or 17. So he's higher <laughs> than Hector Neris. The 3.97 yeah. FIP. That should be close. Yeah, that just tells me he's due for like a little bit of regression in terms of getting hit. Now the FIP could come down. I mean, he could settle in. Still like a smallish sample. You know, twenty four innings. He might throw sixty to seventy in a season. Yeah, I would. I would still take Tanner Scott as a closer to stabilize the pen as it, in in general. Mm-hmm. You said it's a lefty. He's got good velocity. He's kind of he's, he's a two pitch pitcher, but he can maybe give you a chance. You know, maybe once Merriweather's back. You can really establish a good bullpen. You don't need to lean on one or the other as a closer if one of them doesn't completely pan out in that role, right? You can have switch one guy to the eighth inning. So it is enticing, though, because the package won't be a lot. Now, Mason Miller, heard him, uh, the A's broadcaster called him the Reaper, I guess. Uh, he had a one and two thirds inning save the other day. I was like, the Reaper? But I mean, I'll tell you what he's reaping is he's going to he's going to take a massive trade package to get. He's got like 5 years of control. He's 18 years old. No, he's not 18 years old. Oh. But he, oh, I was like, wow. he was only 18. <laughs> just trying to keep it lighthearted. Um he's yeah. got a 1.51 FIP earlier in the year all the baseball media accounts on Twitter were were saying he had a negative FIP and we're like what does that even mean? Uh, you know, is he taking runs away from the game of baseball? I don't understand, um, but he had a fifty percent strikeout rate, which, like, I just saw that number, and that's updated as of the time of recording, yeah. and it's like that is like a video game type fifty percent of the batters you face, you strike out, like yeah, that's insane. a closer, and I feel like if he has that much control, like years of control, if you could get a closer right. like that for like five years at a good price, I wonder what it yeah. would take, you know, Cade Horton. Uh, who is not healthy right now quite a Maybe, bit I, you know I've, your best prospects yeah I, probably the it's, top three prospects <laughs> i mean yeah and like I you almost, said plenty like of years of control yeah yeah i just kind of wonder it's, you know at first i really was like man that being that'd be insane obviously i mean you know you connect the dots right away we have a crappy bullpen. He's an incredible bull, bullpen pitcher, a closer. Um, we need a closer. Our closer sucks right now. At the time, you know, it was Alzali. And so, you, you know, of course, you're going to look at Mason Miller like, okay, that's just whatever. Give him what, give what the A's, whatever the hell they want. Just get, get the deal done. <laughs> but I, yeah, I think he's going to command a lot, probably more than Jed's, you know, comfortable with. Yeah. Um, so I think Tanner Scott is probably more uh, realistic, um, even yeah. though, of course, we'd all. My only other, only other thing about Mason Miller is you just saw, um, well, I saw Julio Rodriguez homer off of him um, last night in the bottom of the ninth. And so you know, I wonder if people, if, if players start barreling fastball, like into Talkman. Talkman hit it out at 100 miles an hour. Um, so I mean, yeah, Kopech, Kopech can throw up to, I think one Oh three, right. I didn't even put Kopech on this list. I was going to put a third reliever cause he would have an even cheaper price to, uh, to, uh, attain him, but he has like mm-hmm. a 4.2 ERA and like a 1.36 whip and all these bad yeah. numbers. So, um, it's not yeah, everything I cheaper. Mean, I mean, he throws a hundred, you know, it's, yeah, exactly. I don't know. Like, he's has... not everything. Like if you're having a down year, you know, Miller can throw, Miller is the one that can throw 103, but he also has a wipeout slider too. And again, 10% walk rate. That K minus walk percentage doesn't grow on trees. Uh, right. It costs a lot of money, right? The money grows on trees. Uh, so I've been told. <laughs> money trees. It's a song by Kendrick Lamar. Um, I'll look it up. So yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think the Cubs will go for like a one-year rental in the bullpen and then maybe think about resetting that guy in the offseason. Uh, one guy that I think the Cubs not trade for, although I'd love if they could because they would have to re-sign him in the offseason, is Pete Alonzo. Peter Alonzo has a 792 OPS, 
14 home runs. He's still on pace for like 40 home runs. He's still on pace for probably about 90 RBIs. Only a 19% K rate. That is really good for a power hitter. Really good. The OPS, you'd like to see it like 900 if you're going to give up a lot for him. So I'm hoping he recovers uh, if if they were to get him. You know, I mean, he would, he would, I don't want to say he'd fix the offense because you need the internal guys to start hitting too, but that's a big spark, right? That's a huge spark. And that kind of creates some crowding probably at first base. Uh, but he'd be insurance if he can't resign Belly in the offseason, right? If Belly doesn't opt into that player option, you could go crazy for Pete Alonso, but of course he's a Boris client. Um, and then the last, you know, offensive target we have here is Alex Bregman because he could play third. Those are struggling, which I did not think I'd say. Got nine homers, yeah. um, twenty nine ribbies, almost a seven hundred OPS, yeah. only a fourteen percent K, like high contact guy. That's something yeah. you need, and also I think he will get his OPS up. But maybe that will also cheapen the package a little bit. He would still probably cost quite a bit. I think he has over an 800 career OPS. So you'd be paying for the, the uh, you know, what he's known for basically, n- not just this year in general. But I would like Bregman. I don't know if there's any other offensive players that you're hoping for. Uh, but I do think the Cubs should consolidate some of these minor league players and go get a bat, you know? I would love a big Alonso. I mean... Yeah, his nickname, of course, is the Polar Bear. Uh, you know, so I mean, connect yeah. the dots, right? Because um, he's polarizing. That's why he's polarizing. Yeah, he's <laughs> quite the polar figure. <laughs> Average has gone up. I know. I noticed that um, it was only, I think, two seventeen last year, which is pretty bad. Um, yeah. But he's it's gone up to two thirty eight so far. Obviously, less at bats. Um, so, but you like you mentioned the K percentage. You know, nineteen per K rate is just that's great. Um, and then, yeah, you know, yeah. he's on pace for 40 home runs. That's incredible as well. So OPS will still probably go up a little bit. Um, so you obviously want to see him at you know 800 or higher um, for your sluggers. Um, so, I mean, I would love, you know, unfortunate. The unfortunate, I think, real realization is that it's going to cost us. So Bregman, I don't know. Uh, his number amazing. Uh, is an amazing. It's not, it's not bad for for him. Um, I think his OPS is down over the last uh, year or two. Um, but yeah, like you said, it will. It, it'll probably go back up though. Yeah, it's to me. These are still you know these are exciting guys to talk about, especially if they have control or you could resign them. But um, just thinking about like what you would do with Morel and what do you do with Bush, like. The tough thing is, do you trade for a guy that can fill third base, play third, play third, have Morel move to DH? It sounds like a dream. And then if there's an injury, maybe Bush plays at first. But you just traded Jackson Ferris for Michael Bush. So you just bet on Michael Bush to be your first baseman, and then you turn around and, and trade. Now, he still has, I think, one more option year. You can use that. And then you just you'd hate to give up on him so soon. Given that you just mm-hmm. made that like your big acquisition this year, you might as well have just made an acquisition for a true star. And they're just, they were just going for cost control with Bush. So that's that's where the asset mismanagement to me to me that goes. You could trade Jackson Ferris and someone else for a bigger star that was a more sure thing at first. And then you wouldn't have to make that acquisition, right? But um right. of course, one of these guys, if you trade for him, it's insurance if Bellinger walks next year. Um so it just makes it a little bit more crowded right now. There is some crowding because Talkman is playing so well. PCA is a, you know, he's a speeding bullet on the base paths. Uh, he's a creator of chaos. He forces errors essentially with his speed. That's what you want. And he's a good defender. So if he can even moderately hit, he's going to stay up and, and get at bats. So it's, like I said, it's going to be a tight, it's going to be a difficult tightrope walk, you know, for council to figure out how to optimize these lineups, even you know, maybe you add a surefire hitter that plays every day, and then you got to figure out how to get Morel enough at bats. Um, I'm still surprised at his OPS, given that he like pretty much leads the team in home runs. That's still kind of shocking to me. Uh, but you know, they will have to figure those guys out, right? They'll have to figure out how to play them and what matchups. Um, you know, especially if they add somebody. To me, it just seems like the catcher. 
don't want to say it's the number one priority, but it's the easiest fit. It's simply a trade. I don't have a, a name off the top of my head. Let me just say, you know, Pedro Ramirez or, or Matt Mervis or something, or Elias Diaz or whoever, and then just DFA Jan Gomes and say, see ya. Thanks for, you know, the last year or so, the years. I don't know how long he's been at the Cubs. He's been at the Cub for 10 years. I don't know. Uh, he, you know, and then and then you can bet on Amaya a and Diaz or something like that. That is so much easier of a fit where a bullpen guy, maybe a DFA Drew Smiley, you're going to DFA mm -hmm. Hendricks anyways in July once he gets his 10 years and gets free health care for life. So the bullpen to me just seems like an easy place to upgrade, but it just feels like catching and really hitting in general is the number one, you know, trade, trade uh, target. It's like, can they upgrade hitting? They can't really upgrade starting too much at this point. They just they need to pitch a little bit better from from starting. Yeah, they were really good at the start of the year, and then May they really took a nosedive in general, you know, all around. Um, but that's why we're talking trade targets today because this team had a you know uh, a mirror of last year's May. It's just incredible how they sucked in May back to back years. I thought that'd be different this year, but clearly. These guys just don't like playing in May for some reason. May is a beautiful time of year. I, I love May. <laughs> Go on vacations each May I can, each May I can, you know. But for some reason, the Cubs hate the month of May. And so that puts them in the more predict, you know, more of a predicament. Like, are they buyers? You know, this is going to be the month really to push them in that direction or even early in July. By 4th mm -hmm. of July, all star break, you know, maybe you get El Monte back. And then maybe you get Merriweather back. And all of a sudden, this average to okay bullpen actually might look pretty good if those guys are back, right? You might have five or six plus uh, strikeout pitchers or three or four of them. And then maybe now your bullpen acquisition is like, you know, leaning towards its Tanner Scott or you know, something maybe even lower than that, um, not giving up a lot. And maybe then they'll focus the resources on a pure, you know, power hitter, you know. I think Pete Alonso would be a great fit because it, there was a, you know, rumored like two way connection there, but the whole joining the Boris group, you know, I don't know what a decision Boris really lost some steam here this off season. I and mean, you look at Jordan Montgomery and Blake Snell, those decisions really cost those, those guys, um, Boris dragging their free agency out, but that's a discussion for uh, another day that I hate Scott yeah. Boris. <laughs> Uh, moving on here, <laughs> me too as well. I have the Reds, obviously, we talked about that come today. Um, we're right now it's uh four to five. Um, Zach, what are your series? Uh, I'm not looking forward to it. I thought it was nice to play a team that is one of the worst disgraces in America and the White Sox. Um, uh, and now we're playing a team that's in our division. If you look at like green. Bolo, Abbott, and Montas are only really favorable matchup is that Sunday in Managa Montas. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that that pairing. But that's what I'm worried about. Because Steele hasn't looked good. Assad has been sort of mediocre. So um, you know, they need to rally. They need to rally. They need to be able to get to their bullpen. Honestly, these starters are too good for us. So get to their bullpen, make them throw only four or five innings each game, get the pitch count up and then attack the bullpen. And like I said, I think that our bullpen has been a little bit better, but can the starters who have all turned out duds, right, consecutively, can they can they improve a little bit against a really good hitting team? And then what will they do about Brown? I think Wicks should just come back. Just come back, Wicks. Um, Hodge down, he did well. He needs more yeah. seasoning, obviously. And get right. Brown in the freaking bullpen. He throws 99, 98, and he has a nasty curveball. Yeah. He's destined for the bullpen. Get Wicks back in there. He need a couple starts, but he's a good starter. He's got a really good repertoire. And uh, I, I think we'll probably lose the series, unfortunately. But I'm really hoping for a split. And that way it won't necessarily decrease our momentum. It'll just keep us feeling optimistic. Keep us 500. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts, anything you're worried about, or any player spotlights. For the series, um, well, I just kind of noted our keys to victory here. Um, you know, we want our starting pitching, like you mentioned, just to kind of to do better. Obviously, versus Montes, Frankie Montes, that'd be a good um, game to watch. Um, the starting pitching is unfortunately dipped, and so um, the offense is kind of a little bit. 
Um, Suzuki hit a two-run homer today, um, even though we're down four to five. But he's starting to kind of heat up a little bit. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about possibly moving him to DH more. Um, and so hopefully that continues. We want to hold De La Cruz to a minimal impact in this series. No hits, which, of course, today he had a three-run homer. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we want to control the red, the Reds' um, running game. This is there, I think, in the top three, top two or three, and as far as their aggressiveness on the base pass and stealing uh, bases. So hopefully we can kind of control that a little bit. Minchak throw over to first and or second and just kind of limit the damage there as far as um, – extra bases allowed there so all right well that's all the time we have for today thanks for joining us here on the brotherly cubs podcast hit that subscribe button turn on the notifications or join the conversation with us on twitter at brotherly cubs or spotify and apple podcasts i am your big brother john and i am your little brother zach we will see you next week as we recap the series uh with the reds until next time thanks for tuning in to the pod and we will catch you later listen to this crowd